and welcome to the 22nd webinar from the Global ESCO Network, where we are this time finally presenting what the network is in fact all about and what it was established for four years ago to provide recommendations on how countries organize themselves in order to promote the use of energy service companies. My name is Søren Lutken, I'm the chair of the Global Esco Network. Uh, and for once, this is now an internal uh, show where Pierre Langlois and I, who are representing the, the Global Esco Network, um, are presenting to you what has come out of our efforts over the past years to establish uh, the Global Esco Network and its purpose to provide advice for governments uh, that wish to improve the conditions for improving energy efficiency through the use of energy service companies. The Global Esco Network is, was established to be the global driver and inspire government actions for scaling up the contributions of ESCOs to the global response for mitigating the threat of climate change. So we were established in the context of uh, the climate change agenda. We are hosted by the United Nations Climate Program, the Copenhagen Climate Center, obviously in Copenhagen, uh, which is the climate change uh, implementing arm, so to say, of uh, UNEP. The mission clearly, when we established the Global ESCO Network, was to add and reinforce already existing efforts of national and regional, regional ESCO associations that were already promoting the activities uh, of, of ESCOs to promote, promote uh, energy efficiency. But it's not a recognized sector in every place. Uh, it is growing, or at least we feel that uh, ESCOs are growing in importance and they are increasingly recognized also in political uh, contexts and in, in policies established around the world. Uh, but there's still a long way to go and particularly in the climate change agenda, ESCOs are not acknowledged as the implementation mechanism that it could be in order to fulfill the energy efficiency ambitions that countries express in the nationally determined contributions. So we want to under, uh, support a better understanding, not only in the political uh, sphere, but also in the finance sector, uh, which is an important partner of uh, ESCOs in many places to secure the investments that, that uh, are underpinning uh, the achievement of energy efficiency goals. We are also promoting the establishment of ESCO associations around the world. And of course, the ESCO associations are our uh, platform on which we hope to um, promote the policy advice that today's webinar is about um, and which we have spent well, the past three or four years in developing together with not only our advisory board, but also ESCO associations uh, affiliated to uh, the network. So we hope that with today's webinar, we're finally coming up with the instrument that we need in order to have a consolidated approach to promoting uh, the use of ESCOs for both financiers and policymakers around the world. Of course, one size doesn't, doesn't fit all, but I'm sure that Pierre Langlois will, will go into more details on each of those six pieces of policy advice that he's going to present right after my introduction here. Uh, I should also say that we are pursuing increasingly the objective of, of the Global Exco Network in promoting ESCOs as the instrument to pursue uh, energy efficiency in nationally determined contributions. The conference of the parties COP28 in Dubai is uh, coming up in next next week, well actually starting in a couple of days from now. Uh, the Global ESCO Network will be present um, and strongly present in several uh, events during uh, the COP where we have the chance to promote um, not only ESCOs but also the policy advice that we are going to present uh, today. I should also say maybe that this is a sneak peek because the official launch, the publication in which these pieces of policy advice 
uh, is going to be launched in uh, will only come online um, just after the COP. So we we do not have the document available for you yet for for download, but it will soon be there. So so this is the first sneak peek, as I said, to to what the policy advice uh, that we are coming out with uh, is all about. And uh, while I'm with uh, events, upcoming events, we do have the first international ESCO symposium in 2024. To be held in Paris on the 29th to 30th of May 24. Um, it is not only for ESCO associations, but it is in fact uh, both for associations and ESCOs and all stakeholders uh, in energy performance uh, contracting. Uh, we are having it at uh, UNESCO's premises in, uh, in Paris, and we sincerely hope that you would consider to participate uh, in this event. Uh, as I said, it will be the first international symposium for ESCOs, uh, but we, as indicated by, by the messaging here is the first, we hope to make this a tradition, a uh, uh, gathering point, an event that all stakeholders in the ESCO market and industry, including policymakers, can turn to, to get the newest uh, updates on the ESCO industry and the prospects of achieving energy efficiency goals through the use of ESCOs. With this, I would like to hand over the uh, microphone to Pierre Langlois, who's going to present the policy recommendations of the Global ESCO Network. Over to you, Pierre. Thank you very much, Soren, and uh, hi to everyone. So, well, thank you very much for this uh, introduction and uh, thank you for the launch of the uh, symposium. I hope that uh, many people will come in and uh, meet with us and exchange about the growth and the development of ESCOs within the world as a tool, as you mentioned, to um, fight climate change and to um, help into the energy transition. Um, we did a small presentation of this new policy recommendations in uh, Madrid uh, last week uh, with Soren, where I had the chance to present to the uh, National ESCO Association and ESE um, in Madrid, and starting to introduce these policy recommendations as a base for the development of uh, the ESCO market in many countries. Um, the policies are essentially six pillars to what we believe is needed within the market to help promote and develop ESCOs in each of the different legislations where they can uh, add value to this energy transition and climate change um, fight. Um, I'll go through each of one, but as you see, they are pretty much uh, self-explaining. And uh, what we found is in most countries where um, ESCOs are growing and they're having a real impact, all of these are present in one way or the other within these markets, and we believe that the policy will help um, different stakeholders within a country to develop um, the necessary tools and the necessary market space to enable ESCOs to start up and to grow. As far as the definition, I think ESCOs are, um, an ESCO concept is very difficult to define because essentially we can define it a lot by what it's not, and, and, a, and a lot less by what it is. So anyone that work into the energy se sector can technically call them call themselves an energy service company. But the way we present it on our side is energy services um, companies have to be defined in a very specific way. Um, as you see in the definition, it's a little bit long, but it helps define what exactly we refer to when we refer to an ESCO. So we obviously talk about a legal entity, we talk about energy services, we talk about energy efficiency, and we talk about demand side renewable energy services. Uh, most ESCOs, if not all, um, within countries work with a demand side approach. There are certainly models where we can work a little bit on the, on, the, on the supply side, but mostly when we refer to an ESCO is we're working on the reduction of the demand, working through different tools, including energy efficiency and, and demand side renewable energy. We essentially, as an ESCO, work within facilities where we accept some degree of financial risk when we implement the project. So what really define an ESCO and differentiate it from a consulting firm, uh, a construction firm, a bank, um, 
is essentially that its remuneration is directly linked one way or the other to the performance of the project based on a measured and verified approach. Um, this link doesn't have to be for the entire contract duration, doesn't need to be 100% uh, directly linked with the performance, but there has to be a minimum component of risk involvement related to the performance. So we're able to define what an ESCO is. An ESCO does not need to finance either or organize financing. There's a lot of models where ESCOs are not involved in the financing. And very often what we say uh, in new countries where they think as, as an ESCO is a financial mechanism, well, essentially ESCO, the, the ESCO is not a bank. It's not a financial mechanism. It can involve financing. It can involve a lot of things but it's not necessarily involving financial mechanism. So we see in the definition that we really refer to a remuneration scheme to define the nature of an ESCO on top of the services it does provide and on top of the approach it proposes to end user in order to reduce their energy consumption and their global impact uh, related to this in, uh, energy consumption on the environment. We also believe that for um, uh, uh, a perspective of getting credibility to the ESCO, an accreditation, an accreditation registry is needed and is welcome. Such a registry can be done by a lot of a lot of organizations. In some countries, we have a national government-based accreditation scheme. In some other countries, it would be the ESCO Association who develop such an accreditation for themselves. But in all cases, these national ESCO registry always include some um, elements that are always present in these structures. So obviously we have a list of the accredited ESCOs because that's where we refer to the ESCOs who are part of that accreditation, uh, accreditation scheme. We have a performance feedback on ESCOs from users. So we wanna make sure that the ESCOs are performing to a level that is of high quality, and that's what the registry is all about. So we register ESCOs that are performing within um, a certain quality uh, approach, and they are recognized for doing so within the market, which give credibility. We provide information about the process to become accredited, which is either on a national basis for the government, or maybe even more on a commercial basis for an association that still represent the, 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 all its members, and the end users who want to validate or to refer to ESCOs will have to know what they have to do to become accredited. We certainly recommend that all of these registration uh, approach, there is an ethical statement for the accredited ESCO, so they have to follow certain rules of conduct. And we want to make sure that they are at the level of credibility that will not impact negatively the other ESCOs within the market. As we know, it's very difficult to get that, that concept uh, be recognized as a valid concept. It seems very often too good to be true. But once that Tesco market develop, it doesn't take a lot to discredit it by bad projects or bad conducts by some ESCOs. So we really want to make sure that these ESCOs are at the highest level possible of quality, of integrity. And that's why an ethical statement is very um, important within the accreditation scheme. We have obviously the uh, contact information because the, 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 the objective of the registry is to promote these ESCOs and to promote them within the market. So we want them to be, to be easily contacted. And there has to be a dispute resolution window in the sense that um, in the case, and it happens in all market, there, there would be some kind of dispute. There is a standard to address this dispute uh, referring to different mechanism, but it's embedded within the accreditation registry, so people know that the concept is real, it is recognized by peers, it is recognized often by governments, and in the case of problems, there is a way to address it, uh, or address them uh, in a structured way, supported by whoever is managing the registry. We're referring to a standard contract, and uh, we have to be careful here, we don't want to mention or to say that everybody has to use the same contract. But there has to, to be some recognized component of a contract that needs to be agreed between parties when we refer to an ESCO. Um, and, these ESCO and as we know, these contracts tends to be complex 
and they're very often one of a kind when we go see a client we do we go see um, subcontractors escos are not necessarily well known energy performance contracting may be perceived as being difficult complex so uh, and the contracts are all unique at some point but we still believe that within a good market structure there is a reference to some base contract that are able to uh, give um, the basis for negotiation in, there in the public or the private sector. Well, in the public sector, it's pretty easy because very often through programs, they will have a standard contracts to be used by all parties. And this is the basis of negotiation, which is often not very flexible because government has its own way to address all its uh, market related to performance contracting. In the private sector, it's certainly more flexible but still having the core of the ESCO model presented um, within a, a reference structure, would it be, again, the accreditation scheme? Would it be at the government level? Would it be at the National Energy Efficiency or whatever, uh, the National Energy Efficiency Agency? Uh, but, it, but it's interesting to have some, sort of, some type of basic component of these ESCOs. So when clients look at them for the first time, they can refer to the standard and say, okay, well, it's used, it's recommended by some authorities, it's recognized by them, and it's something I can start dealing with because it's recognized. So it will ensure quality, transparency, effectiveness, obviously. It will have within that contract to explain and present a risk allocation scheme uh, and associated payment scheme that are that are common within the, the way the EPC works. Um, it will refer to a base contract without providing necessarily a contract, but at least the element that should be um, included in this contract. And again, an acceptable dispute resolution scheme based on the accreditation concept that I presented before. On the financing mechanism, well, even though it's not a policy by itself, financing is core to its energy efficiency approach that we have. Would it be with um, an energy performance contracting scheme? Would it be any otherwise? These projects, and especially the deep retrofit type ones, uh, obviously request investment. And these investments are very often the biggest limitation um, of client, for clients to actually implement these projects, even though they are uh, technically sound, they are financially attractive, but still the needed financing need to be there. So we believe that within countries that are um, developing very well in the EPC, there, there, there is the presence of some type of financing mechanism. Would it be on the public sector, where in many cases the government finances it themselves, so not requiring external financing, but it's still a financing mechanism, or in the private sector that will need something to enable them, if necessary, to, to use um, adapted financing to actually support the energy performance contract scheme to be implemented. Out of these financing mechanism, we can name many including revolving funds, dedicated credit lines, um, guarantee for um, commercial and uh, financing institution, super ESCO scheme, uh, forfeiting. There's a lot of ways to do that, but the fact that in a country, some, one or some of these mechanisms are present, obviously enables the growth of the ESCO market. And we believe that within the policy, at the policy level, um, governments that would have to recognize when implementing these policies that financing has to be a part of what has to be worked on and has to be developed to be present in the countries to enable these ESCOs to operate and that market to flourish. A straightforward clarification of accounting, fiscal and taxation issues. Um, energy performance contracting is a, is, a, is a very specific scheme as we know. And depending on the model that is used, um, we face a different type of issues related to accounting, uh, fiscal treatment, and taxations. And very often, these elements are preventing the um, ESCO to develop. And even when it's adapted and it's well-structured within a country, the fact that it has to be looked at for each individual deal, especially in the private sector, um, is a constraint. Because obviously, if we have to reinvent the wheels all the time, and we have to go back to lawyers and accountants and tax experts to explain how these contracts um, will have an impact on the balance sheet of clients, it becomes difficult, it becomes um, costly, and it prevents uh, people to enter into these transaction costs at some point that are needed to make sure that these transactions are fit to their personal situation. 
So we believe that a higher level within a country, because it's always related to a specific country, these fiscal and taxation um, implications, that there is some wording at some point within a government scheme presented at the national energy efficiency agency level, at the ministry level, at the association level or whatever, any uh, body that is trustworthy about the use of performance contracting to present the high concept about how this accounting taxation and um, fiscal approaches uh, are usually treated or dealt with within a contract. We believe that this should come from a national perspective, obviously, so it's not something that could be taken um, uh, easily by, by anyone. And as a very simple example of all that, that notion of, of balance sheet, where very often uh, uh, stakeholders or people will claim that, it's, uh, that that treatment can be of balance sheet, and some will say that it's all impossible based on different rules, including the IFRS, that is made uh, a lot more difficult, if not almost impossible, to develop now on the private sector uh, enough balance sheet type of scheme. So addressing these issues can be dealt with at the top level, can be made credible by having some uh, very credible references at the national level, and would enable parties to start a discussion on a credible basis without having to uh, spend a lot of time and money to readdress the same issues all the time that are obviously uh, very important and fundamental to uh, the use of performance contracting. And that's even um, more important in the private sector, obviously, because uh, the fiscal impact is, 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 is theirs. But even at the, at the public level, the, the way the accounting uh, will be done and the way the taxation issues will be dealt with is very often something that uh, because of the nature of EPC and it's so specific, uh, even government bodies wanting to use energy performance contracting based on some legislation, on some invitation to do so, and facilitation to do so, are stuck with. Um, and having such an approach at a policy level would be very, very helpful uh, and should be part of the global policy approach for performance contracting. The last one, and I mentioned it, is that in many countries, uh, and I would say even in most countries, uh, EPC started with the public sector using uh, ESCOs as a vehicle to implement energy efficiency projects. Um, it would be the case of many countries in the OCD, I would say the US, Canada, and many in Europe, where the public sector has been key to start up this market, creating that ESCO market. And based on that approach, the ESCOs market start, start uh, developing not only in the public sector where there are uh, these requests for proposals, but as well in the private sector because now they're, they have a base market within the public sector and they're able to demonstrate their accomplishment and get a head start on the private sector. In order to do so, we need a very strong public procurement process. And as we know in every country, um, there is specific rules about how contracts, however type of contracts are to be implemented, there are procurement rules, and most of the time when, it, when it's not addressed, these procurement rules are either preventing the use of performance contracting or limiting it in, in a lot of ways. So what we really propose is within any country that wants to address a progressive policy for the use of EPC as a vehicle to address energy transition and climate change, um, public agencies should um, directly develop uh, public procurement uh, ESCO services uh, contracts and the way that our, the procurement should be done in order to enable these transactions to be done smoothly, easily, without too much um, complexity and enable um, these projects, especially on the, on, the, on the duration side, to not be capped by a very rigid multi-year contracting limitation. And uh, on a, that specific topic, we know that if we want to achieve the goals of the Paris Agreement and what is going to be discussed as well in Dubai in the next few days, we need energy efficiency to play a key role, but not only energy efficiency as a short-term solution, but essentially energy efficiency as a deep retrofit solution. We need the very long-term payback projects to be implemented if we want really to make an, a real impact in the market. And that's how government can help by having these projects being implemented within their own facilities, Using energy performance contracting is certainly a very good approach to limit the technical risk, to enable potentially financing to come in, but it has to be addressed as uh, limiting 
um, the, or, or eliminating the limitation on very short-term payback approaches. Um, that uh, these procurement processes has to be linked with the modalities of public-private par partnerships and joint ventures, uh, because it can enable different ways to do that. As we know, energy performance contracting is a very flexible approach, um, and it has to be open to different schemes that will fit different type of facilities to um, benefit from the full services and uh, added value approaches of energy performance contracting. So these are the six base pillar policies that we're proposing to adopt by countries who want to um, promote and use energy performance contracting as a, as a vehicle for market transformation, again, energy transition and climate change fighting. And on this, um, we will welcome your inputs when the document is published. It's going to be the first edition. We hope that it's going to be uh, disseminated within countries and you can use it within your discussion with the public sector, um, within as well with the ESCO Association to try to implement these pillars. And if they have to be complemented, adapted, improved, then we will not hesitate to have a second edition based on your contributions because the um, Global ESCO Network is essentially an association that represents all the stakeholders. We're proposing um, added value concepts as this one, but for sure we want to have a market return and um, improve uh, whatever we provide as tools within the market to enable um, energy performance contracting to thrive within countries. On this, back to you, Soren. Thank you very much, Pierre, for the presentation of our policy advice. And I think I forgot to mention in the introduction that we really welcome your questions on our our platform. I think uh, I'm looking at our webmaster. Aris is just across from me here, and we we have the platform open for you to to post your questions. So so please drop your questions um, as as they occur to you. Meanwhile, I I have I think. Um, a first question for you, Pierre, which is about um, how to go about implementing these these uh, recommendations. Uh, should it be considered as a package? When this this is the six things you need to do in order to get the market going, or is it a menu approach where you can say, well, this one I like, but that one I don't like, so um, I will just take it one by one. But then. Well, what would the consequence of such a menu approach uh, potentially be? Well, Sarin, that's really a good question. And and, and I guess um, everybody listening will agree that uh, it would be very difficult to say that without these six, the energy performance contracting scheme cannot grow. So what we believe within these policies is that each one has its own merit and its own value. Um, some organization can organize some of them. I think about ESCO Association, which are the core of the global ESCO network. So, for example, in accreditation, if the government is not picking it up, then the association can do so. So, having a very good startup, uh, as an example, in the US and Canada and Dubai, um, there are different type of accreditations. Some are ESCO Association related, some are government re uh, related. But association can play a good role, for example, in this. So uh, we believe that having the six is the perfect uh, tool, the perfect structure to enable ESCO to drive. But in the meantime, uh, adding one at a time is certainly helpful because what we need in the market is credibility at first. So the accreditation, for example, is very good for that. Having standard contracts uh or some base contracts is very helpful to help pescos uh so I've, adding them one at a time is probably the reality of what's going to happen but at the policy level if a government really wanted to say well within uh, our next uh plan we really want to have escos as being part of uh the solution then having the six in place would be best but to be realistic one at a time, two at a time is probably going to do the work as well and enable this market to start growing in each of the individual countries. I guess add, adding on to that question would then be what if it will be one by one, and is there is there one that you would recommend a country with a relatively clean slate uh, to start with? I think it always depends on who we're talking about. If you talk about countries, so therefore you talk about government, I think the public procurement scheme is certainly one that should be on top of everything because it would enable these projects to be implemented. 
um, adding to the public procurement scheme needs to have a financing mechanism attached to it. Not necessarily only an external one. Uh, it could be government driven. It could be government financing their, their own projects. But having a, 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 a procurement scheme without having the capacity to finance these projects at the public sector level would be useless. So again, these two are probably the key elements to jumpstart a market because then you have a real market uh, in place. You have real tenders, you have real projects, and you have ESCOs being attracted. Um, I remember the case of the Super ESCO in Dubai when uh, I started to help to support the, that, the, the creation of that entity. There was no ESCO, no projects, uh, but a lot of potential. Um, that Super ESCO was a public driven approach out of the utility. We started to launch tenders, uh, ESCOs came, came in, well, you launched it and they came, uh, and then the project was started. And then as of today, um, I think uh, the Emirates in general and Dubai in particular are a very good example on how to jumpstart a market through a policy approach where the Super ESCO scheme as a policy driven approach uh, related to procurement was launched. The financing was attached to it and then everything else followed at the same time in their case uh, with the accreditation scheme and others. But really that jumpstart the market with actual projects. We can have all the policies in the world. If we don't have projects, then we don't have a market. So I think the government have in their ends um, a lot of potential buildings, a lot of potential facility and launching them um, or launching projects within them through a policy approach on the public sector using um, an adapted procurement for ESCOs is certainly one that would jumpstart the market for sure. Okay, I would actually have thought that you would start with an ESCO definition so that we are sure that, that um, the services that we would end up procuring are actually up to standard. But then on the other hand, uh, we know from, from uh, different markets that uh, we may have to have a gradual approach to sort of, uh, grow ESCOs into becoming the, the fully fledged um, suppliers of energy service uh, energy services, as as our proposed definition indicates. But yeah. but in many markets, companies are not ready to comply with all those requirements. Yeah. Could could you could you see a staged approach where ESCOs graduate to different uh, tiers of of uh, service provision. Yeah. Or should we have this is one uh, unflexible, as we have been indicating here, one unflexible approach to what is an ESCO? Yeah. Well, to come back to your first point, I'll come back to the second one pretty rapidly. The ESCO definition, I think, is important. The challenge is very often ESCO definitions, the way they were set up in countries, were limiting. And they were not opening up, as you mentioned, I, and I'll go to your second point. So I think the ESCO definition is something that the global ESCO network is very well positioned to propose because then it can become a worldwide reference. You know, what is an ESCO, what is not an ESCO? Uh, global ESCO network can agree on something and all countries can pinpoint to it. It doesn't have necessarily to be in the, in the legislation. But, imply, but it has to be implied within the procurement scheme that I was referring to. You cannot have, have a procurement scheme for ESCOs if we don't know what the ESCOs are. So I think we're, we're, we're linking here about uh, the need to have such a definition. And the point of graduating, uh, I think it's essential. We cannot believe that ESCOs will appear out of nowhere. So um, what we hope with ESCOs, it's not only gonna be international organization that can transpose their model from one country to the other, but having national organization, smaller organization, uh, transit from consulting, con um, construction, uh, and whatever type of services they offer to an ESCO and, and taking uh, a little bit more skin in the game uh, and creating that credibility to have projects implemented. So yes, they have to be a graduation. And again, I'm going to refer to the case of Dubai, where uh, within the accreditation scheme of uh, at, the, at the Dubai level, there was such um, a level uh, pushing organization to, well, or enabling organization that, that didn't have all the qualification at first to come in within the accreditation, so be recognized to start up the process. But it was also needed for them to take the necessary step within three years to graduate. And um, as any market, it has to grow step by step. We need a minimum, so so we don't we cannot have anyone say that they're an ESCO just because they're they're providing um, consulting services, because that's not an APC approach. Um, 
but we welcome everybody to graduate and that has to be recognized within the accreditation scheme so there are levels um, and even people entering at the first level can get a benefit out of it of credibility of exposure adherence of the concept and principles and everything that is within the accreditation scheme, scheme and essentially setting them up or setting themselves up to graduate for the other levels where we hopefully want them and they want themselves to um, to go to okay maybe i could add an example to to the dubai example uh, referring to um, south africa where sanedi is hosting a, a, an esco uh, accreditation and registry system with three tiers in which um, companies that are working with energy uh, efficiency services can graduate from one level to another uh, and and that is an announced uh, at the last annual meeting where we participated that was announced which companies have now uh, achieved tier one uh, to to serve as full-fledged um, escorts so so there are examples out there that that uh, can be looked to um, for for inspiration if you want to sort of gradually sort of funnel companies into becoming uh, escorts according to the definition that we're proposing here. And I can add one as far because we talked a lot about the public sector, but if you look at the, at the NISCO uh, system as well in the private sector, well, the, the US has been uh, driving the show quite a lot on escorts from early on in the 1980s. And uh, it's a very good reference about ESCO association and how to drive the market and bring escorts within an association that is strong that has a lot of what we talked about and promoting the ESCO at the, at the government level for the you know, increased use of that market. So there's public sector references. We talked about two, South Africa and Dubai. Uh, there's a lot in the private sector as well in association that we promote quite a lot, Seren, within the association, within the Global ESCO Network, the, the, the very important use of uh, ESCO association and the US is one among others. That is a very good reference as well on this. Excellent. Um, I was wondering, I mean, we, we have obviously developed these six pieces of, of uh, policy advice in, in consultation with, with both our advisory board and, and the ESCO associations. Uh, but is it imaginable that this will expand? I mean, we have six now, but at least I remember we were discussing other uh, regulatory frameworks that might be promoting the use uh, of ESCOs, which could have, which could have sort of made the cut into, into the six here, but could you could you imagine that we are expanding the number uh, over time? We could definitely think about it uh, at some point. Obviously, when when we have the the first one, uh, we thought about having the minimum, having the based one. Um, we didn't want to have the uh, the expectations too high and make it too complex because obviously, if we had ten or fifteen or twenty then it would seem like, wow, it seems to be very, very complex. So the base six ones were the one that we believe are key to develop an ESCO market everywhere. But adding some others um, would certainly be of interest. And there's some indeed within the, the little group that we've talked to at the beginning, talking about this policy, there, there came a lot of very good ideas and a, a lot of um, additional uh, elements that would enable ESCOs to drive. But we believe that these six ones are the, really the pillars, and uh, there's still a lot of work to implement these six ones, depending on the country where we where, where we are looking for. So um, yes, there's going to be some, and again, it's a market-driven approach. So the es the global ESCO networks uh, is there to represent all the stakeholders. So out of the people who will consult it, uh, I think maybe it's a good idea to have a, a little piece of within the document to say, well, if you have any other recommendations, please contact us, and we'll debate it and we'll have um, committees of, of experts and uh, volunteers because we rely on volunteers within the, 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 the network to add up to this and to have a second edition probably in 2025 or 2026 where a few others um, ranking them maybe by necessary and uh, uh, likely to be interesting. Um, but yes, definitely it's not limited to only these six. Sure. I, I can add to that 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 for the the symposium, the international symposium next year uh, for ESCOs in, in Paris in May, uh, we have in fact on the agenda uh, consultations with the participants on exactly the the scoping of our policy advice. To what extent? Uh, what is the feedback first of all from participants? Um, on on the policy advice and also with with um, 
the, the aim to check whether we have all the essential uh, elements in place or whether there would be one or two that, that we might want uh, to add to, to the package. Uh, I think the important message here is that, as, as you also mentioned before, um, Pierre, it is sort of a menu approach. And of course, there's also countries that have some of the elements in place and need maybe two or three of those that, that we have uh, put in place here. So, so it's a menu approach, but ideally we would have a policy framework that encompasses uh, these six uh, elements. The one, the one I'm thinking of, whether, which we also had on the agenda when we were discussing this before, was that there's an increasing use of mandatory energy audits, um, and that at least helps um, sharpen the minds of people who think that energy efficiency is not necessarily important. Uh, with a mandatory audit uh, scheme, at least you get uh, visibility of the efficiency potentials that are, that are achievable. Um, but but those are elements that we that we may also discuss at our international symposium uh, in May in uh, in Paris. We don't have any more questions from the floor, as far as I can see. On Aris, no, he's shaking his head. Um, Pierre, do you want to add any um, final observations? Well, the only thing, and I'll build what you said, is the symposium in May in Paris is something that we really hope as many people as possible will, will come to. Uh, it's going to be um, an interesting opportunity to have stakeholders exchange and to talk about all these elements that um, help develop that, that concept. So we hope that ESCO associations will come, as well as ESCOs and any other stakeholders. We welcome government officials to come in as well. Uh, we'll start promoting it quite a lot very soon and this policy uh, piece of advice and recommendation uh, is going to be part of the discussions as well so um, i'm sure we can improve on that it's the start and i think it's the basis of what we will work on but again everybody's welcome if you have any recommendation i think sorin and i will welcome them uh, and we certainly welcome to meet you in person in paris in a few months so we can um, continue this discussion and having a, a very interesting um, event with the contribution of all. Thanks, Pierre. And, and on that note, I would also like to welcome you to join us at the COP in uh, Dubai in a few days from now. We will be putting the program uh, of the Global ESCO Network's presence on our website. So please consult our website uh, today or tomorrow. Uh, for a list of where you can find us in Dubai over the next uh, couple of weeks. Uh, so we look forward to interacting with you, to meeting you um, there, as well as, of course, at the International uh, ESCO Symposium 2024 in Paris. With this, I would like to thank you very much for participating. Um, we are switching off now from Copenhagen. Take care and goodbye.